The author says, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon him. How to back up our rational argumentation with religious texts. So in the first place, you know that there's two types of proofs. There's dalilun aqli, intellectual proof or rational proof. And there's dalilun naqli, documentary proof. The Wahhabi doesn't want your intellectual proof. But we're going to give it to him anyway. We're still going to tell him if Allah were in the place. And where was he before he created places? And we're still going to tell him if something is in a place, it's a body. But he doesn't want those rational arguments. He only wants religious texts. So then a sound mind concludes that Allah exists without being in a place or direction. That's the judgment of the mind, the judgment that the Wahhabi has no regard for, the intellectual judgment. Since places and directions are attributes of created things, bodies, that's a fact. This sound reasoning complies with the verse, Laysa kamithlihi shay. Nothing is like Allah in any way. For the Wahhabi, this ayah is not clear. Laysa kamithlihi shay. This ayah is not clear for a Wahhabi. But according to him, Ar Rahman wa ala al arsh istawa is crystal clear. So he's backwards. If Allah were in a place, many things would be like him. That's an argument. Had he been in a place, had Allah been in a place, then he would be one of the things in this world. He would be something in the world. Then that would be against the ayah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. He's the Lord of the worlds. He's not part of the worlds. He's the Lord of the worlds. Being the Lord of the worlds means he's not part of the worlds. If he were in a place, then he'd be a part of the world. His existence without a place is not impossible as Wahhabis think because they think he's a body, so he has to be somewhere. On the contrary, the mental judgment confirms that Allah exists without a place because he existed before he created places, as already clarified. We say to the Wahhabi, did Allah create all places? So there's a good chance that he's going to not want to even answer the question. We'll come back to say that, inshallah. He'll stop the conversation right there. And he might say, yes, he created all places. And then you say to him, so then it means before he created places, he existed without them, right? So there he might want to then just stop the conversation. And or he will tell you, you're rationalizing. You're trying to be uh, reasonable. If someone says that clearing Allah from all places is negating his existence, then where, then where was he before he created them? Such a person tries, but cannot imagine Allah existing without a place. So he thinks that would be denying his existence. Yani, when we said Allah exists without a place, and then he tried to imagine that, and he wasn't able to, then because of the weakness of his mind, he saw his inability, he interpreted his inability to imagine something as a denial of existence. He tries, but he cannot imagine Allah existing without a place. So he thinks that that would be denying his existence. The Wahhabi does not know what it means to say nothing is whatsoever like Allah. To say nothing is like Allah is not clear for him. Because he would say, Allah, we know where he is. He's over the Arsh. He has two eyes and two outstretched hands and a uh, foot and fingers. And he goes up and down. All of that, we confirm it. Then if you say to him, but... Allah is not like anything. You say, yes, that's true. So he doesn't even know what it means to say Allah is not like anything. In fact, some of them blatantly ignore this aforementioned verse. Laysa kamithlihi shay. He believes that Allah needs something that Wahhabi. Actually negating a place for Allah is denying that Allah has a body. Since the place is the space that a body occupies. It is confirmed that Allah exists without a place. And therefore is not a body. That's confirmed. That's a consensus. So it follows that he is not attributed with organs, motion, or time. And is absolutely unlike all his creations. That is the judgment of the sound mind in this issue. As supported by the explicit texts of the religion. 
Question. Is it not correct that Allah will be seen? So this is the Wahhabi's question. Once we argued with him and we wouldn't back down that Allah exists without a place and that Allah has not a body. And we gave him proofs and we gave him arguments. Then he still can't reconcile what we're saying to him with what he has been imagining all this time. It's like he's saying, but what you're saying is different from what I've been imagining. Don't you believe that we can see Allah? So that question there, that's because he's been imagining something. Because we do believe that we can see Allah and that Allah will be seen. But there's no place for that question here. Only The only reason for someone to ask that question here is because he's been imagining something. And then when you explain to him that Allah has not in a place or a direction, then you will be wiping out his imagination. And then once his imagination has been negated, he says, wait a minute. I, it, so how would I see him then? Another indication that these people truly liken Allah to the creation and believe that he is a body and that they imagine something, although they claim that they do not, is that when it is said to them, Allah exists without a place and is not a body, shape, or color. They say, don't you believe that Allah can be seen? As already mentioned, we do believe that Allah will be seen. But the reason for this question of theirs, after our negation of created attributes for Allah, is that our elaboration wipes away whatever they have been unconsciously imagining, or else there's no reason for the question. Once they truly understand what we mean by saying that Allah is not a body and he exists without a place, they find themselves unable to imagine that and thus ask, but don't you believe that Allah can be seen? It's like another way of saying, how could he not be a figure? Indeed, Allah can be seen, but he is seen unlike the creation is seen. Their belief is that Allah is seen in a direction and a place, like a creation. Our belief is that Allah is seen unlike the creation is seen. So he is seen without being in a place or a direction. This is a topic that can be explained for pages. So we will summarize by producing some of the Sunni quotes that clarify the correct belief. Abu Hanifa said, Wallahu ta'ala yura fil akhirah. Allah the exalted is seen in the afterlife. Wa yarahu al mu'minuna wa hum fil jannah. The believers will see him with the eyes of their heads. Something's missing here. The believers will see him when they are in the garden. Wa yarahu al mu'minun. The believers will see him wa hum fil jannah. While they are in the garden. Bi'ayuni ru'uthi him with the eyes of their heads. Bila tashbihim wala kayfiyatim wala yakunu baynahu wa bayna khalqihi masafa. Without any resemblance. Bila tashbih. Yani without any comparison. Wala kayfiyah. And without any manner of being. Without any mode or without him having any way about him. And without there being between him and the creation any distance. This is the wrong there also. This is loaded with typos. Without there, T-H-E-R-E, being between him and the creation any distance. So if there's no distance between him and the creation, then means he's not a body. He's not a form or substance or figure. This means that Allah will not be close or far, high or low, big or small, etc. when he's seen. Imam An-Nasafi said, وَقَدْ وَرَدَ الدَّلِيلُ سَمْعِيُّ بِإِيجَابِ رُؤْيَةِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي دَارِ الْآخِرَةِ The certainty of the believers seeing Allah the exalted in the afterlife was narrated in the transmitted evidence. فَيُرَى لَا فِي مَكَانِ He will therefore be seen without a place. 
Yani, he will be seen not in a place. That's what he said. He didn't say, La yura fi makan. He's not seen in a place. He said, Yura, he's seen. La fi makan. Not in a place. He's seen without being in a place. So he will be seen without a place. Wala ala jihati min muqabala. Or being in an opposing direction. You will be seen without being across from anyone. And without the connection of light rays. And without the establishment of a direction between the seer and Allah the exalted. Allah exists without a place. And despite that, he is seen. So yes, he is seen. He exists without a place and he's still seen. Yani seeable. Can be seen and he shall be seen. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La tadamuna fi ru'yatih. You will not crowd together to see him because he doesn't have limits. He doesn't have limits so that they would have to gather together to see him. Like the people gather in the movie theater to see the movie screen. Because the movie screen has limits. Like the people gather very tightly together to watch a game on a small television. Because the small television has limits, so they have to gather closer to look at this thing with edges. But because Allah doesn't have edges, then when they see him, they will not have to gather together. That means a person would be... As we have here. In paradise, they will not have to gather or face any special direction to see Allah. Wherever they may be in paradise, as wide and vast as it is, and whatever direction they may be facing, each one doing whatever he does, wherever he is in the garden, minding his own business, doing whatever it is he's doing, in whatever direction he is, in whatever place he is in that wide place, Allah empowers them to see him whenever he empowers them. He empowers them whenever he empowers them. As for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Kama tarawna al-qamara laylat al-badr Like you see the full moon on a clear night. This does not mean that Allah has a circle seen like the moon. Like some mindless Wahhabis really believe it does. How dumb do you have to be to, be, to believe that Allah has a circle? Rather, it means that you will have no doubt that you saw Allah like you have no doubt about seeing the full moon on a clear night. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ did not compare Allah to the moon. He compared the certainty of seeing Allah to the certainty of seeing the moon. He compared the sighting to the sighting. Not the creator to the creation. He didn't compare the seen creator to the seen creation. He saw the created sighting of the, the slave seeing their Lord to the created sighting of the slave seeing the moon. Why? What's similar? The similar is the certainty that they will have about what they see. And there's no similarity between the created one and the eternal one. This is the proper belief in seeing Allah, and it does not mean that he is a body. An ignorant person may ask, what does it matter if they believe that Allah has a body? What's wrong with that? The answer is that such a bad creed is against the explicit texts of the Quran, and the explicit texts of the hadiths, and the consensus of the scholars, and as just addressed, the judgment of the mind. We just clarified the judgment of the mind about the issue. They don't care about the judgment of the mind. So what about the Quran and the hadiths and the consensus then? Since they claim they want religious texts. Question. What if the Wahhabi says, I do not want your intellect. Give me some Quran. Besides the mental proof, meaning rational arguments, we also refute them by referring to some very simple and basic textual proof. Documentary evidence. It is not correct 
to depict Allah as a body by literally interpreting 20 different verses. If it, each individual verse of Surah Al-Ikhlas correctly describes Allah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say Allah is one without a partner. So that's not a body. And that's that's a very sufficient description of Allah. Allahu samad, Allah the master who's resorted to by all and who does not need anything. That doesn't describe a body. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He did not beget. That means he did not give birth. And he was not begotten, meaning he was not born. So that's a sufficient description of Allah Ta'ala. Yani the mind suffices with that. God is the one that is not created and he created everything. Yeah, okay. That's good. Walam yakullahu kufuwan ahad. And there was never for him any match. There was never a similar for him. So he's the one who exists without a similar, without resemblance, without comparison. Okay, that's good. The mind is happy with that too. But Wahhabi Creed, you need 20, for example, different verses. 20 is just a number to mean a lot. Different verses, so to... Uh, fulfill the depiction of a body. So if a Wahhabi wanted to, he could start from the head and go down to the feet, like we did. When we presented the Wahhabi creed in this book, we showed how they believe that Allah has a face, and a real face, and real eyes, and really smiles, and he has real hands, according to them, two real hands that are outstretched, and real fingers, and they said he sits on the throne, or that he rose over the throne, and they said that he has a shin. And they said that he has a foot. And they said that he casts a shadow. They said he has a right and he has a left. They brought all those together just to not describe a man, according to them. All of those, they brought them together to not describe a body. Really what they did was they brought them all together, described the body, and then forbade you from saying the quiet part out loud. They forbade you from saying the secret out loud. But in particular, there is one verse from the Quran to which we shall cling to refute their entire foundation. One verse to which we shall cling means this is our main verse for refuting them. Here, in this discourse of ours, doesn't mean that if you are in a live debate, you have to choose this one and stick to it. Rather, the point here is for us to say, if you want a Quranic proof, here's one. Learn it and stick to it. But if you want a hadith proof, we'll give you one. Learn it and stick to it. If you want a consensus proof, here's one. Learn it and stick to it. Learn how to maximize the use of your proof. Learn how to argue maximizing your evidence. Yeah, and you don't want to waste. Are you the type of person who uses everything until there's nothing left to throw away except the trash, except an empty, useless husk? Or are you the one who will throw away? Are you the one who, for example, you'll throw away the toilet roll while there's uh, plenty of tissue in there? You're the one who will throw away the uh, container of drink while there's two or three gulps left down in there? Or are you going to use it all the way up until there's nothing left? Use it all the way up till there's nothing left. So one proof at a time. Which one you're going to assess your debate? As a general rule of thumb, though, I advise you, if you want a quick, immediate go-to, to go to the hadith. Can Allahu alam yakun shay'un ghayruhu. Allah existed and there was nothing other than him. This will give you stronger debate than laysa kamithlihi shay'. Because Laysa Kamithlihi Shay, they don't understand it. So they're going to argue with you with a corrupted understanding. The hadith, can Allahu alam yakun shay'un ghayruh? Allah existed and there was nothing other than Him. It's not that they don't understand it, they just don't believe it. And so you can pummel them with that authentic hadith that they don't really believe in and they can't get around it. 
So this verse, Laysa Kamithli He Shai, nothing is like him, is a decisive verse, a verse whose intended meaning is plainly clear. It is explicit, not ambiguous nor figurative. It means that there is nothing common between Allah and his creations, that Allah is not like anything and nothing is like him, that every creation is not similar to Allah in any respect, that Allah cannot be compared. This is the meaning. This is enough to protect you from falling into the blasphemy of likening Allah to his creations, which is shirk. Take a closer look at that explicit verse. So here it's transliterated for you, so you can pronounce it. Unlike him is anything. The word laitha is the word of negation. So it means not, or it means un. The first letter prefixed, the first letter prefixed to the next word is the kaf. With the fatha. A word made of one letter simply pronounced ka. It originally means like. It is affixed to the word mithl, mithli, meaning like, as if it's saying nothing is like his likeness. The last letter suffixed on the word mithli is the ha, with a kasra. Mithli he. So it is actually pronounced he. Laitha ka mithli he shay. It is a third person masculine pronoun, meaning him. And it refers to Allah. The last word in the verse is shay, which means a thing or something. It is a general indefinite term referring to all the creations. It is easily noticed that Allah revealed the word mithli, like, with the addition of revealing the kaf, which means like. So you can notice that easily. It's going to say like is likeness. Hmm. Raise your eyebrow there. Uh, okay, continue. The negation of this combination emphatically denies any likeness to him. If the calf were removed, so had it been it would still mean that nothing is like him. However, Allah revealed the calf, added to the mithil, and this emphasizes the meaning that nothing is like him. Furthermore, the term shay is indefinite, which means something or a thing, something, anything. It's indefinite, not referring to anything in particular. It just refers to anything that's called a thing, which means anything that exists. And whenever an indefinite noun is presented in a negative context, then the meaning is an all-inclusive negation. Uh, that sounds fancy. Let's break it down. In other words, look at the difference between saying he is not like a thing and he is not like the thing. The first of these two is more inclusive. It includes more. He is not like a thing, not anything whatsoever, because of being indefinite. Because the term thing is indefinite. From this, we can know that Allah is clear of having or being a body, and is clear of organs, motion, places, directions, and change. According to the judgment of the mind, attributes such as those would draw similarities between Allah and his creatures. Many other verses negate likeness between Allah and his creations. Like Al-Ikhlas 4, وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدِ Never has there been for him a single match. Surah Maryam has a rhetorical question. هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ Do you know of anything like him? And the answer is no. Surah Al-Nahl and Al-Baqarah have a prohibition. فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ Do not make comparisons for Allah. فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادَ Do not make contenders for Allah. So what do we have here? We have وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ That's a statement. A negation. A negating statement. Then, Surah Maryam, we have a question, but it's a rhetorical one. هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيَّةِ Do you know about someone like him? No, you don't. And in Al-Nahl and Al-Baqarah, we have a prohibition. Don't do it. فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ Do not make comparisons for Allah. فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا Do not make contenders for Allah. So there you have a bunch of proofs. 
But when you argue with the Wahhabi, you don't have to tell him this one. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيَّا فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ You don't have to do that. However, the best of the aforement, sorry, because of the aforementioned emphasis, the most explicit verse is Allah's stated denial. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing is whatsoever like him. Whoever is lost in the ocean of confusion from the prevalent ignorance among today's Muslims, let this verse be his plank of wood for staying afloat. Never liken Allah to his creations. No matter how many verses a Wahhabi may bring to you to convince you that Allah is like a body. We say that it is not permissible to interpret any text in a way that attributes bodily characteristics to Allah. Because doing that will make the verses of the Qur'an contradictory, which is impossible. For the Wahhabis, this contradiction is minute. That's why they reason like Christians. Just like for a Christian, he doesn't mind to say one and three are the same. The Wahhabi doesn't mind to say Allah is not like the creations, but then to say he's in a place and in a direction. For the Wahhabis, this contradiction is minute. And it is acceptable and it's insignificant because they do not believe that the sound mind has anything to do with faith. As mentioned, nothing is whatsoever like him is a decisive, explicit verse. And again, a decisive verse is a verse that can only have one interpretation according to the Arabic language. Repetition is good. Our Sheikh taught us that. We repeated ourselves many times here. And Shaykh repeats himself a lot in his books. In one book, he repeats himself. And throughout his books, he repeats himself. And the Quran has repetition in it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he used to repeat himself. He would say something three times, for example. And Imam at tahawi has in it a lot of repetition. It is important to know the merits Allah gave the decisive verses. In Surah Al-Imran, verse 7, Allah told us, مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ Within the book are decisive verses. They are the base of the book and other verses are ambiguous, susceptible to more than one meaning. They're mutashabih. The mutashabih verses are not the base of the book, but the Wahhabis act as if they are. For Wahhabi, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa is very explicit. So you are, for a Wahhabi, you are a moron for not understanding this very clear ayah that Allah has over the throne. And then when you tell him, Laysa kamithlihi shay, but Allah said nothing is like him, he say, yes. So he doesn't know what he's talking about. Showing their misunderstanding of this verse and their misunderstanding of the true meaning of Laysa Kamithlihi Shay, nothing is whatsoever like him. The true Sunni Muslims follow God's rule, which is that the decisive verses are the base of the book. So for the Sunnis, their base is Laysa Kamithlihi Shay because it is decisive, explicit. Then when encountering attributes of Allah, whose literal meanings would liken Allah to the creations, like al-yad and al-ayn, al-wajh, al-istiwa, al-istiwa, etc. The Sunnis then interpret those verses in a way that does not give Allah a body or an attribute of a body. Because these words, ayn, yad, wajh, istiwa, they can have more than one meaning in the language. Don't forget, we have two things we need to consider here. The language and the religion. So even if the meanings that the Wahhabis chose are meanings found in the language, they don't comply with the rules of the religion. They are people who approach the religion without having proper background information. These words can have more than one meaning, as will be seen in the second chapter, if Allah willed. This is the straight and sound way, which stations the decisive verses as the base of the book. 
Is an alternative explanation required for the apparent meanings of every ambiguous verse? Any ayah that, or hadith that its apparent meaning compares Allah to the creations, then yes, it is required for any verse like that. But don't forget, there's two ways to do an alternative explanation. One way is to not determine what the exact alternative is. So it's saying there is an alternative because it's not the literal meaning. The fact that they're saying it's not what appears, that means in itself that they're looking for or going for, going with an alternative explanation. But they don't take the next step and say, and that alternative exactly is X, Y, and Z meaning. They didn't go that far. They just said, it's not the apparent meaning and Allah knows what it does mean. That's safe. That's what some people call tafweed, forwarding the affair to someone else. And other scholars, they said, it exactly means katha, such and such. And as long as that complies with the rules, then that's fine too. And that's needed for the layman who need something firm. The layman who needs something firm. For the layman, for some layman to stop short of determining what that is, that alternative meaning is, for some layman, this is not good enough. Yani, their minds aren't there. So they need something more concrete. Question. What if he claims that it is not permissible to say, and then stop right there? One of their tricks is to say to us, when reciting this ayah, you should not stop where you stop. You people, you always say, and then you stop there. You must continue and read to the end of the verse. He is the hearer, the seer. And from there, they will accuse you of distorting the meaning of the verse by saying, yani, so they're saying, you're perverting the ayah when you just say, and then you stop. They distort the meaning of the verse by saying, just as it is valid that he hears and sees while nothing is like him, it is valid that he has a face and hands while nothing is like him. Exclamation point. However, the scholars have always mentioned this amount of the verse. Laysa kamithlihi shay. Even Ibn Taymiyyah in some places. He just would say, Laysa kamithlihi shay. Because according to the recitation rules of stopping and starting, al-waqfu al there is nothing truly prohibiting stopping at that spot. If you learn the rules of al-waqfu wal ibtida, that's part of learning how to recite the Qur'an. Really, there's nothing wrong there, start stopping there. And also, when they make that argument, it's as if they didn't read any books of the scholars. To make that argument is like they're saying, come on, man, what do you think, that I read any of the books of the scholars or something? You're acting like all the scholars have always done that, and I have no idea. There's nothing truly prohibiting stopping at that spot. If one looked into the book of the Quran, he may even find a sign atop the verse signaling, signaling to the permission to stop there. If you know the symbols of the Mus'haf. There would be nothing left before the Wahhabi to say, oh, that's for the recitation, not the meaning. He would go there. Respond without being surprised that he would resort to such foolishness. Don't be surprised that he would say that. He is that dumb. You respond, how could a valid recitation give an invalid meaning? You silly rabbit. Furthermore, if we recite this amount of the verse, <laughs> nothing is whatsoever like him, and he is the hearer, the seer, that's still not the beginning of the verse. That's not the entire ayah. So what made it permissible for you, O oh Wahhabi, to start at Laysa Kamithlihi Shay, even if you continue all the way to the end? Why didn't you just start all the way at the beginning of the ayah? If he says, because this is the part of the verse related to our topic, then answer, respond to him, without being surprised that he refuted himself. Respond to him without being surprised that he refuted himself. Tell him, for the same reason, we have recited the amount that we have recited. 
there was simply no need to recite to the end of the verse to prove our point. Question, but what about when the Wahhabi said, if he can have hearing and sight, why can't he have face and hands? We covered this last week. I told you it was going to come back. Here it is. The fastest clarification of this confusion is knowing the difference between concrete and abstract nouns. Concrete nouns, in their literal sense, are physical objects, like faces and hands. In Arabic, they're called ism ayn, concrete noun. And abstract noun, they call it ism ma'na, ism ma'na. Here, ma'na means abstract. So concrete nouns, in their literal sense, are physical objects, like faces and hands. Abstract nouns, even in a literal sense, are not physical objects, like hearing and sight. From there, clarify that the hearing and sight of Allah are not by eyes and ears. They have no beginning or end, and they are not restricted to time or direction or volume or light. And thus, they do not resemble the hearing and sight of the creatures. It's just the same word only. We're actually able to make a contrast. Make a contrast, important word there. That means to show the difference. To make a contrast and show the difference, that's the same thing twice. Contrast is opposite of comparison. Comparison means show the similarity. Contrast means show the difference. We are able to make a contrast and show the difference, although the words are the same. Because we can say sight, the sight of creations is by eyes. The sight of Allah is not by eyes. The sight of creations is by light. The sight of, cre of Allah is not by light, etc. The hearing of creations is by ears. The hearing of Allah is not by ears. The hearing of creations is by sound waves. The hearing of Allah is not by sound waves. The hearing of the creations is based on direction. The hear hearing of Allah is not by direction. So it's not similar. It's just the same word. But the Wahhabi cannot do contrast. If you told him, what's the difference between his face and, and our face? They would say, we don't know how his face is. That's all they can say. So what's the difference? It's like you're saying it's a face. It's not a face. No, he'll say, no, it is a face. Okay. But, but then it's like you're saying you don't know what face means. No, I know what face means. Say, okay, so... What's the difference then? He'll say, we don't know how his face is. So that's not a contrast there. That's just a proclamation of ignorance. It's not a contrast. We are actually able to make a contrast and show the difference, although the words are the same. The Wahhabi is unable to make a contrast. All he can do is make comparisons, and that's what they do. They don't even realize when they make comparisons. We showed some last time. And told you about what one Wahhabi told me once. I think I still have the recordings. There's a lot of noise in there, though. When the Wahhabi said, I told him, but if Allah is, don't you know Allah existed before he created directions? He said, yes. I said, so if he created directions, it means he changed. He said, no. Then he said right out of his mouth with complete unawareness of self. He said, that's just like me. If I was somewhere and then I put something under myself, it doesn't mean I changed. That's exactly what he said to me. Or a Wahhabi would say to you, do you say our hand is like the hand of a clock? Do you say that our hand is like the hand of an ant? We don't know how Allah's hand is. He doesn't even realize that that's the comparison right there. He's making comparison, not a contrast. It was for this precise point that his hearing and sight were mentioned after the negation of any and all resemblance to anything. In other words, Allah told us in his book, nothing is whatsoever like him. So he established his uniqueness. And then after knowing his uniqueness, we are informed that and he is the hearer, the seer. That is so that we would know that his hearing and sight are different from that of the creations. It's not so that we would justify claiming that Allah has a body unlike other bodies. Wahua sami al basir is not a way to argue that Allah is a body unlike other bodies. That's basically what the Wahhabi is getting at. So this is the key for answering their question to us. Why is it valid for you to say hearing, sight, knowledge, and power? 
but you prevent us from saying hands, fingers, face, and eyes. Respond, hearing, sight, knowledge, and power do not necessitate a body. Unlike limbs and organs, unlike limbs and organs, these attributes are ma'ani. They are abstract. They're meanings. They're not objects. They do not dictate composition. They do not dictate physical structure. Memorize this debate template. And you will likely refute any Wahhabi on this point. Here's the template. If they say they are real literal face and hands, respond, then you have likened Allah to the creation because real literal face and hands require composition and physical structure. So if they say they are not literal, then they have made ta'wil. If they say, we do not know the meanings of face and hands as attributes of Allah, then you respond, how can you translate something without knowing its meaning? If they say, we translated the Arabic into the English counterparts, respond, the Arabic terms have meanings that the English terms do not, and vice versa, the English terms have meanings that the Arabic terms do not. So they're not truly counterparts. They're not exact matches. It's not the case that the word wajah in Arabic is an exact counterpart for the word face in English, such that all of its definitions, all the definitions on both sides just line up completely. And the same for yet versus hand and ayn versus eye, etc. So they're not true counterparts. If they say we translated the Arabic into the English counterparts, respond, the Arabic terms have many meanings that the English terms do not. And vice versa, the English has many meanings that the Arabic terms do not. And since they are not counterparts, it is the intended meanings that must be translated, not the general word that you think is the counterpart. Because you think it's the counterpart, that's why you're choosing it. It's the exact meaning that's intended in the exact statement that needs to be translated or explained. The context must be observed, not merely the word at face value. If they choose to use only the Arabic words, wajah, yad, etc., without confirming any specific meanings for them, and saying nothing more about them than that they are attributes of his, and that he knows about them, if that's what they say, and they don't go further, then they have complied with us. They said, these are his attributes, he knows them, and we say wajah and yad, and we don't say what they mean. Then they said what we say. Their twisted understanding of this verse is from their grandfather, Ibn Taymiyyah, who confessed that he compares Allah to the creation in his tafsir for this verse. In, the, in his tafsir of this verse. In his book, Bughiyatul Murtad, Ibn Taymiyyah said, Qala ta'ala laytha kamithlihi shay fanazzah or fanuzzih. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ فَشَبَّهُ or فَشُبِّهُ وَهِيَ أَعْظَمُ آيَةٍ أُنزِلَتْ فِي التَّنْزِيهِ وَمَعَ ذَلِكَ لَمْ تَخْلُ عَنِ التَّشْبِيهِ Ibn Taymiyyah said, The exalted said, nothing is whatsoever like him. Thereby he was exalted from resemblance. Then he said, and he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing, and thus he was likened. That's what Ibn Taymiyyah said. He said, Allah was likened in the Qur'an. He's saying, in the Qur'an, Allah was compared. This is the greatest verse revealed concerning God's exaltation from resemblance. And despite that, it was not devoid of resembling him to others. He's saying, the Qur'an confirms comparisons for Allah. That's their master, Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, like I told you, this book is color-coded. Also, um, the formatting is coded. So if you want to find a deviant statement in this book, then it should look like this. The Arabic should look like this, this font here. And then the English translation would look like this, this typewriter style of font here. The reality of Ibn Taymiyyah's claim is that the Quran contradicts itself. Question, what if the Wahhabi says the meaning is the same, but the degree is different? They have to say for themselves, the meaning is the same. They're not going to let that go until they repent and believe in Allah properly. Respond by quoting Imam at tahawi 
who said about what the Salaf believed. وَمَنْ وَصَفَ اللَّهَ بِمَعْنًا مِنْ مَعَانِي الْبَشَرْ فَقَدِ كَفَرْ Whoever describes Allah with a meaning, meaning an attribute of mankind, has blasphemed. Whoever described Allah with any attribute of human significance has blasphemed. If the Wahhabis are truly Salafi, then why do they not agree with this belief that was documented by the Salaf, agreed on by the Salaf, and thus passed on? It is because they take what they want and they leave what they want. If the Salaf believed that the one who ascribes a humanistic meaning to Allah is a kafir, then how do these so-called Salafiyya consider themselves Muslims since they say the meaning is the same but the degree is different? They mean that the meaning of hand, face, and eyes is the same when attributed to Allah as when attributed to the human. Same meaning. But it's a different kind of hand, face, and eye. They do not know if the face is long or round, if the hand is human or squirrel, if the fingers are digits or tentacles, if the eye is reptilian or goat, etc. They don't know. They don't know how. By this, they attribute the meaning that relates to humans, the meaning of human significance. They relate that to Allah. And as just mentioned, for that, the Salaf made takfir. They judged one as a kafir for that. Be careful. They do truly say the meaning is the same, but the degree is different. This statement is blasphemy. On the other hand, if they say that the meanings of yad, ayn, and wajah are not the same, not the same when attributed to Allah, and they stop there, then they agreed with us. We say that too. But if they were to say that the meanings are not the same, then what happened to taking them literally? Say, okay, that's true. But how you said you took them literally then, where's the ma'na and haqiqi according to you? In other words, the literal meaning is the meaning that refers to the creations. That's the meaning the creations have. The literal meaning is the meaning the creations have. When we talk about, when we talk about those concrete nouns so when they use the literal meanings of these terms they are using the creation's meaning the bodily meaning let's stop there allah knows best so what do they mean by this word degree in this question that's just the camouflage it's when they say the meaning is the same but the degree is different that's like saying the meaning is the same but we don't know how it is the meaning is the same, but it's beyond our comprehension, or it's beyond our imagination. You're welcome. SubhanAllah, how deceptive of you. But I learned a lesson from one Wahhabi as far as their dishonesty. When there was a guy who's learned from me, then the Wahhabis told him, don't learn from me. So they put doubts in his heart. So he used to go back and forth between us. And he would ask me questions and I would answer his questions. And he wouldn't know, like, he wouldn't find any answer for that. But I saw in himself, like, he doesn't want it though. So I noticed how he was uh, wishy-washy, not straightforward. And then I said to myself, I think this guy is going to defect from us. He's going to go with those Wahhabis. And that's what happened. Yeah, they are Christians and Wahhabis. They are very similar. But I think Wahhabis are most similar to Jews. The, the, the parallels between Wahhabis and Jews, I think, are many more. But the... Uh, the Jews, they don't usually try to argue for their beliefs, though. So the Wahhabis are like Christians in trying to reason what they believe. Because just like the Christian is trying to reason that one and three are the same, the Wahhabi is trying to reason why Allah is in a place, but he's not like anything. And he's trying to reason why these words should be taken literally, but they're not like body parts. 
And the Christian is trying to tell you why the father can be the son and why the son could be the father. How it's possible that the son didn't come after his father. How it's possible that the father didn't come before his son. And how it's possible that they're both the same person. Subhanallah. But in terms of being rotten and mean and dishonest and tricky, they're like Jews. And in terms of wanting, and according to their claim, to practice the religion of a prophet, to practice the sunnah of a prophet, they're like Jews. Just, yani, imagine those Jews with black hats and curly locks and strings on their belts and black suits. And that's, according to them, they're practicing. I don't know what. Those Wahhabis are like that. So they want to cut their pants over their ankles and grow beards and wear kufi. Subhanallah. Also, a similarity between Christians and Wahhabis is that they both make da'wah. The Jews, they don't make da'wah. Yes. Rejection of rational proofs, dishonesty, lying, arrogance. Exactly. There's a guy, someone just put me down to his YouTube video. He claimed that the Ash'aris said that there's a particle that doesn't have a size. I said, do you have a reference? He said, check this book of Ibn Taymiyyah. I said, do you have a reference from an Ash'ari? He said, the Ash'aris, there's many books where the Ash'aris say that there's an indivisible particle. So yeah, then I'm not asking you about the indivisible part. I'm asking you about the sizeless part. Where'd you get that from? So how he's trying to jump around there. He said, sizeless. So I told him, where you got, who told you sizeless? He said, check Ibn Taymiyyah's. Check the book of Ibn Taymiyyah. I told him, Ibn Taymiyyah is not an Ash'ari. Do you have an Ash'ari reference? Did the Ash'ari said that? He said, the many Ash'ari said there's an indivisible po- atom. See, he switched right there. I was never asking him about the indivisible part. So I told him, I'm not asking you about the indivisible part. I'm asking you about the sizeless part. Where'd you get that from? So that's their religion. So weak, they have to make up arguments that nobody argued to misguide the people. Subhanallah. Yeah, it takes some it takes some practice. Haj Ali, he used to say, the Wahhabis are like slippery fish. So you talk to a Wahhabi, he's going to try to slip out of your hands. You have to know how to grab arguing with a Wahhabi is like knowing how to keep a grip on a slippery fish. Also, one Wahhabi recently came to my page, my channel, and he he tried to open up so many arguments. Answer this, answer this, answer this. La, khalas, this is my channel now. You answer me. I have, I have yeah, over 800 videos now. You're going to make me repeat myself? You answer me. So khalas, he has nothing now. He hasn't responded since. And if I had answered him, what he would have done, he would have avoided everything and he would have just kept talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. Yeah, he won't answer anything. He will not answer anything that I say to him. He'll just keep talking and talking and talking and talking and talking.